Bienvenidos, welcome. I don't know how to say it in any other languages. <laughs> We're so excited to have everyone here. Um, let me know in the chat where you're from and today's topic, if you've ever moved to another country, just picked up your life and moved to another country because I've done it, our guest Steven has done it. First and foremost, my name is Leah. I am the Los Angeles chapter leader. I'm an event producer and a podcast creator and host. And I help Erica and the Nomadic Network run these events. And I love meeting all of you, talking to you, seeing repeat faces, seeing new faces. So once again, welcome. And I see that chat filling up. <laughs> and our guest today is Steven Heiner. And he's going to tell us how he moved to Paris and how you can do it as well. So I'll do a little intro on him um, after we go through a few housekeeping rules. Uh, just to, things to keep in mind, really. So first thing is you all will stay on mute uh, during the entirety of the presentation. Make sure you drop your questions in the chat box because we will be reviewing them after the presentation. Uh, you can turn your camera on. We love seeing faces, but you can leave it off too. That's fine. Uh, definitely use the chat to connect with other people, um, ask questions, support Steven's story. <laughs> and if you can, please start your questions with the word question so that I can like filter them out afterwards when Steven and I are chatting and answering them. Um, replays are available to Patreon members and we'll explain the Patreon at the end. So like, you know, we're saying we're here to learn, say to your, your wanderlust, have fun. And we can get started. So a little bit about Steven. Steven is currently in Paris which is great. He's a writer, coach, entrepreneur living there. Um, he's built and sold a brick and mortar educational business. Now he's focused more on smaller location independent lifestyle businesses, which is great, support small business all the time. And that allows him to travel more, uh, read, write, spend time with things and people and places and, and activities he cares about. So he is also the chapter leader for the Nomadic Network in Paris, which is so great of you to volunteer your time and your knowledge and your resources. So Stephen, I'm going to let you take the floor. Thank you very much, Leah. I'm trying not to, my eye wants to go down to the chat window and like keep up, but I, I know that if I do, then I'll just get interested. So <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. So I'm not ignoring you, I'm just, I'm just paying attention to the bigger picture, guys. So Erica told me that it would be better for me to get a presentation, even though I'm an old fogey who didn't really grow up with PowerPoint. Uh, I went, I, I put together this for you guys. So thank Erica. And then uh, if you like it afterwards, then you can thank me. So as Alia said, I'm Stephen Heiner. I have a website called The American in Paris, which I've used to chronicle my immigration journey to France for the last seven years. So there's your fancy title page. Um, who am I? Cliche American writer living in Paris. Not the first one, won't be the last one. I do uh, brand representation work for small businesses. So things like blogs, email newsletters, press releases. But I also write about culture and immigration for magazines and websites, primarily in English. I now have smaller lifestyle businesses, having built a brick and mortar business in America and having worked those hours one of the things that I promised myself, whatever I was going to do after I sold the business, was not do that again. I know you hear these stories, people like, they sell a business and I'm going to go build an even bigger business and make even more money. And that wasn't me. I'm not saying that's wrong or bad. It just, it just wasn't me. Uh, I'm also, as noted, the Nomadic Network chapter leader here in Paris, although we brought on a couple other cool people since to help out. Although that's helping out theoretically because we're not yet having meetings. So we had, a, we had a fantastic last meeting with Matt. Uh, maybe we infected him with Corona, maybe we didn't, but we do know that he was positive within 14 days of that meeting. So um, none, of us, none of us were. So thankfully something, something uh, didn't, didn't happen too bad as far as our chapter, but we're really looking forward to coming back. We have a really vibrant chapter in Paris. And if you guys stop by and we're still having events later this year, we would love to see you. Okay, fun travel shot. Does anybody know where this, where this is? And Leah, you can tell me in the chat so I won't look. It is, it is south of the equator. 
No. Scotland, Australia, Cape Town. Cape Town was going to be my guess. Okay, Australia is correct, but can you tell me which state in Australia? Is it Tasmania? Is that Mount Wellington? It is. It is Tasmania. It is Mount Wellington. Stop! Yes. <laughs> was I that totally you? Hiked. I yeah, that was me. I hiked it. I had the craziest story from it. It's also if you guys have seen the movie Lion with Dev Patel and uh, Nicole Kidman, this is a scene in the movie. If you were here, I would offer you one of my peanut butter M&Ms, which I brought back. <laughs> I already have Europe. one from you, but thank you. <laughs> this is like, the, not available in Europe, peanut butter M&Ms. So I brought it back <laughs> uh, last week when I flew back. Okay, so I'm facing the South Pole. I'm top of Mount Welling. Tasmania is one of my favorite places on Earth. It's certainly my favorite place in Australia. This is Mount Wellington. Hobart is down there in the bottom left corner. And in January of 2013, I had sold my business back in October of the previous year. I already knew by the time that this shot happened that I was going to be moving to Paris. Um, but part of that was this journey. Going on this trip to Australia, in which I was really free to think about things, confirmed for me the desire to, to, to move to, to France. So sometimes um, going somewhere else will confirm that you want to go someplace else. So I was in Australia when I knew for sure that I wanted to move to Europe. What visas have I obtained? So I've obtained two, the long-term visitor visa and the Profession Liberal visa. So I know the ins and out of those extensively, but I'm also going to tell you about two visas that I haven't obtained, but I have friends who've obtained them and why they may be advantageous for you, even though I had absolutely no desire or ability to participate in them myself. But I'll get to that in a little bit. Why did I come? So I sold a business in the educational space. For those of you who are American on the call, we have these series of unfortunate exams that you have to take to get into undergraduate and graduate school. And they're called the ACT, SAT, GMAT, LSAT, GRE. I'm sorry if I'm triggering any post-testotic uh, syndrome in you from remembering those things, but I helped students with those. I was in that space for 15 years. I had three different companies in there and I sold one of them. And when I did, that burden that so often happens when you have a business, that I, this, is my, this is my why at the moment, this is what I'm doing. And just living in the present doesn't really give you the space to think about, well, where is this going? And I think in my brain, it was just, oh, I'm gonna sell this business, dot, dot, dot. I didn't know when that was gonna be. I didn't know what I was gonna do after. And that's not a good way to run a business. But when I did, even, even when I got an offer on the business after it was listed, my brain started running in a thousand different directions about what I wanted to do. And somewhere, I guess submerged, unbeknownst to, to me and to my family, because I had never talked about it, it was this desire, desire to come and live in Europe. Now, I had done it as a sophomore in college. I lived in Rome for a semester, picked up some Italian, learned a lot about Italian cuisine, particularly Roman cuisine, uh, which is the best, obviously. Uh, no, I don't get into any fights with people from different regions in Italy. But I knew at that point that I wasn't married, I didn't have kids, I didn't have a dog or a cat or any other pets. And if I didn't go to Europe now after selling a business, I probably wasn't ever gonna go because I had built up a lot of social capital in Kansas City where I had lived for the seven years prior to my move to Paris. And I could have done any number of things. There were lots of opportunities coming my way, but none of them really inspired me. And so I knew that I had to come in. And I suppose this, what do you have to lose mentality um, definitely pervaded. But why Paris, Stephen? Well, I've always had a romantic notion about, about France, uh, probably since the very first time I heard the French language. And I know that doesn't work for everybody, but it's definitely the case for me. But, uh, well, there, there's, an <laughs> there's an interesting story that should have indicated to people that I was really somewhat obsessed with the French. It was sophomore year of high school. And we had to dress up as a historical figure and give a speech. So there's a very famous, if you, in fact, I think there's a, there's a replica of it at the Getty in Los Angeles. So Leah, if you, you've probably seen it, it's in, well, we could talk about where it is in the Getty later, but uh, it's a replica of Louis XIV's coronation portrait. And it's a ridiculous portrait, right? He's got, he's got these tights, this ridiculous flowing train. And, and so, you know, I got a mop dyed it, you know, made that for my hair. And my mom, my mom and I cut out a lot of fleur-de-lis but the problem was I didn't speak French. And Louis XIV 
would would never uh, deliver the speech in in English. It it would be in French. So how am I going to, as a non-French speaker, deliver a speech in French? So I wrote out the text in English. I had a friend who knew French translated into French for me, and then I memorized the pronunciation of it. So so I I read it through, and he corrected my pronunciation. And then I went up there and I delivered this speech in a language that I didn't really speak at the time. Uh, so I tell people, if, if anyone had been paying attention when I was 14, 15, 16, they might have figured out one day this guy might have something to do with, with France. But it was buried under the workaday life of many in the United States, I would argue, whether we're building a business or in a job, you're just very focused on getting enough money to pay bills and just doing that. And moving to Europe is a, a faraway dream. Really, and so that's why I say it was buried. I think, and as I as I alluded to, it immediately came to mind after I got a confirmed offer for the business, which ended up turning into actual sale. Uh, it is the most beautiful city in the world. I'm sure there are other people who want to have arguments about it, and I will have a a reasonable, civil conversation with you about it. But you're still wrong. And there's nothing wrong with being wrong, but that's just the reality of life. When did this happen? As I said, I sold my business in October of 2012. Uh, interestingly enough, I, I, I couldn't just stop after that. So what happened in, I think it was October the 1st and either that night or, yeah, I think the night before, I took my team out for a meal and we had a great time. But then the next day we all immediately went back to work for the new owner. October is a test date for the ACT and the SAT. So we were in the middle of peak season. So we celebrated, went back to work. And then it wasn't until November where I was, let's say, starting to celebrate the sale a bit. So I went to London and Paris. And when I was in Paris, I was talking to a, 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 an Airbnb host about me possibly staying for a year. And she just thought it was crazy. She didn't realize people would do this. But I said, I'd like to stay at your place. I know that you'll probably make more money uh, renting it out short term, but the plus side is you don't have to change linens. You don't have to meet new guests. I'll be your person. So I'd like to come next year. And she looked at me like I was a little crazy, but she just sort of nodded. Okay, that's fine, Stephen. If you come, dot, dot, dot. Now, that gets us to January. So I come back from Australia and I buy, uh, so I went to Australia for a month. I went to every state and territory I love that that place. It's just so darn far away, Australia. Uh, so Australians on the call, you know this. It, it's just true. Uh, and so I came back. I buy a one-way ticket for France in December. Now, there are a couple issues here. One, French immigration won't process a visa for more than 90 days out. So that meant I would have to spend the whole year building towards this thing, and maybe they wouldn't give me my visa. Also, you don't move out of your apartment the same day that you move out of the country, right? So you have to start getting rid of stuff sooner. You have to sell your furniture. You have to figure out what you're going to do with your possessions that you're not selling. At some point, you need to sell your car. So thankfully, I sold my car a week before I left to my brother-in-law's brother, who then very generously loaned it back to me for seven days. I was ready to rent it from him. He's like, no, man, that's fine. Given that I'd canceled my insurance already at that point, it would have been very bad for me to wreck it in the final seven days. So thankfully I didn't. But I did get my visa about six weeks before. And there were a few hangups because I hadn't really learned how French immigration worked and I didn't realize how exacting they are about paperwork. And so there were some delays, but I finally did get my visa with, with only about six weeks to go. And it was an incredible feeling uh, to, to get it. It's basically permission. I said it at the time and I would say it again now. A residence card is a visa, is a, is a permission to start a new life. And I knew that when I looked at that visa. I didn't know what was on the other side of it. And I told everybody I was leaving for a year, mostly because I didn't know how to renew my visa. <laughs> like I had just figured out how to get one, but I didn't know how to renew it. Uh, so I told everybody I'm there for at least a year. We'll see how it goes. And that's what happened. So how do you do this? So I, I alluded to these two visas already. So I, I want to talk about them briefly, even though I haven't. So the visitor visa is the third easiest visa to get. And 
the other two are ones that I'm either not eligible for or uninterested in, but there are people who are on this call who may be very interested in it. So let me tell you about them. The first one is the au pair visa. Would you like to be an au pair in France? Okay, couple of requirements. First, you have to be between the ages of 18 and 30. So old fogies like me, you're out at the first, at the first hurdle, okay? You need to have a basic knowledge of French. You need to have a high school diploma or an equivalent. You have to have a valid passport with your, with your regular, can't expire for six months, right? So you need to have a passport that's got some validity still on it. You need to have an au pair contract. So you need to have already made arrangements with the family. And there's all sorts of matching agencies. I think the most popular is au pair world, something along those lines. You're also going to confirm that you're going to enroll in a French language course for at least three months. You're going to have to be able to cover your travel expenses, but it's not as hardcore as any other visa uh, in terms, basically you need to prove that you can buy a ticket because they know you're getting free room and board. So you don't exactly have to prove that you can take care of that. You need to have in most cases, a clear criminal record. No criminals allowed to be au pairs, completely reasonable. Although that isn't true for every country. And then a brief motivation letter. Why would I like to come to France? Why would I like to learn French? So if you love children and you are a minimalist who can, who's happy to have room and board paid for and sometimes either get paid zero dollars or some of my au pair friends said you were really making the big bucks if you got a hundred euros a week. Um, <laughs> it's, it's sort of like institutionalized um, indentured servitude. Uh, but, uh, and you may not necessarily get the uh, ability to learn French. Some French bring au pairs over to teach their children English. So sometimes you're not brought over for your French language skills, you're brought over to be a native English speaker to the kids and improve their English. So you may not necessarily improve your, you're not gonna get rich as an au pair. You're not gonna have a lot of free time, but you're not gonna have to do any other work. And when you do have free time, sometimes you go on vacation with the families to their homes. And let me say, <laughs> there are some very cool places you can go for your second or third homes in France. So au pair, one possibility for those of you who are 18 to 30, it is, there's no rule that you have to be a female, just it's 95% female. So I, the marketplace, either by the people choosing to be au pairs or the people who are selecting au pairs, it's 95. So guys, if, you're, if you are interested, it's not restricted. It's just, you will be extremely rare. A positive, positive would be if, if you go to au pair meetups in, in Paris, you'd be like, hey, I'm an au pair and there's, you know, you have a, a great ratio. The other way that you can come that's easier than the two visas that I have is as a student. Now, again, Americans were getting stressed out because we think about college costs here. And I don't know that I need to remind you that nowhere in the world does it cost as much to go to college as in the United States. And that's just not the case in Europe. College is mostly quote unquote free. I say quote unquote because it's paid for, but it's paid for by the taxpayers. So it's not really free. It's just paid for by the community. And the fees, they're like the high end for fees would be like 500 a semester. And the French would be really upset about that. So more like 100 a semester, maybe 150. So you're gonna have some fees, maybe some books. But to get a student visa, number one, you need to produce an official enrollment or acceptance letter on the university's letterhead. It's gotta have all of the details, how long you're gonna be there, your name. You need to have sufficient financial proof, which at the moment is around 615 euros. So that's per month. So you can either have that money in a savings account, you can show that you have access, you're gonna get an allowance from somebody, you, you know, your parents could make you a co-signer on, on some kind of fund, some sort of savings that allows you, or you can have it uh, uh, for yourself. Um, but you need to show that you have access to seven, five to seven hundred dollars, five hundred, seven hundred euros, sorry, a month. You, as you're putting together your application, you also have to have an airline ticket showing when you're coming to France, as along with a handwritten note indicating when your intended departure date is. Proof that you have medical insurance with a minimum cover of 30,000 euros. Now, again, Americans, we hear health insurance, we freak out. Uh, you can get foreigner health insurance for anywhere between 20 and 60 euros a month, depending on the deductibles that you want. 
Okay. Now it's not going to cover you for absolutely everything, but it will cover you for what the French want. You also need to have proof that you have accommodation, but the easiest route to do here is to work with the universities. Now, European universities in general and French universities specifically don't have campuses that we think of when we, as we do in the United States, where there's a campus and there's a student union and all that. People live in apartments or they live at home. There's a lot of commuter students. And the best thing to do if you don't want to look for an apartment by yourself in a foreign language is to just lean on the university's placement program. Now you might ask, wait, Stephen, can you still do this now? Yes, in fact, there's been several announcements this week from the French government that they are very happy to take students. You just need to have filled out all the regular paperwork. So the uh, quote unquote ban on Americans to Europe, which is fake news, by the way, you can come to Europe if you're an American, you just, there's a few things that have to happen. You just need, at the moment, you have to produce a negative COVID test within 72 hours of your flight. So. You could conceivably do this for this semester if you move quickly enough. On top of that, you're also allowed to work 20 hours a week at a French job. So you might come to France with, a, let's say you're an older student and you're like, oh, Stephen, I'll pick up a degree, no problem, that's fine. You might even have a remote job. That's what's giving you your, your income. But you can also work a French job for 20 hours a week, which you're likely to get something like bartending I mean, don't fool yourself. You're not going to get some cool internship somewhere when you're, when you're a student. Those are hyper competitive. But it does mean that you can build out your network a little bit. And now here is the special asterisk awesome cheat code for this visa class. If you obtain a master's degree, so however long you need a student visa for. So sometimes people get a student visa for three months just because they want to take this one course. Sometimes people get a visa for, for one or two years because they're pursuing a different program. But if you hold at least a master's degree, according to the French standard, meaning you earned a master's degree in France, you can then apply for and will be granted a one-year non-renewable residence permit. The, this is ostensibly for you to find a job now that you have a fancy master's degree, okay? Now, you will be allowed to work during that time. I, again, not necessarily in a glamorous job. You can only work uh, up to 60% of your regular, of a regular working week while you're, while you're job seeking. And as long as the job offer that you get is for 1.5 times the SMIC, then you can change to a regular salarié, which is a regular employee status. Now, what's the SMIC, Stephen? I have no idea what this is. The French would pronounce it SMIC, S-M-I-C, okay? You have to remember that the words that look to you like English words, there's a French pronunciation for it. So it's not Wi-Fi, it's Wi-Fi. It's not Heineken, it's Inneken, right? So uh, the SMIC as the French would pronounce it, or the SMIC, as us uh, English speakers would pronounce it, is essentially the minimum wage. And it's around 1,400 euros this year. The big news story last year was that the iPhone XS cost more than the SMIC, and that people on the SMIC were still gonna buy it. And this was like the big, the big thing. Because remember, the EU and the US don't have a trade agreement. So Apple goods have a tariff here, like they're marked up. So don't be surprised when your French friends find out that you're, you're coming back to America and they say, hey, can you buy an iPhone for me? You're basically going to save them hundreds of euros and you can, you know, extort some champagne or something. But when you come across, you're just going to have to tell the French that it's your iPhone. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, I didn't get to the, the cheat code. All of that is fine. But if you go through all of this and you've gotten your master's and you've been here in France, <laughs> for whatever reason, the French have decided that your two years of schooling or more, you could have done three years of schooling, eliminates the five-year residency requirement for citizenship. So us poor schmucks who went through the whole, like, I've got to be here five years. If you're a student, you only have to do two. Now, mind you, there's a bunch of other, red, there's a bunch of other requirements for citizenship, and this isn't a guarantee, but this is definitely a shortcut that isn't offered in any other visa classification. That is just a fact. Now, I don't know how long they're going to keep it. I can't promise you that the French won't change their mind, but the French are very slow to change things. Uh, so this is, this is going to be here for at least a while longer. I have a Ukrainian friend 
who's already submitted her dossier last year. So we're expecting that she might get it in the next 12 months or so. There's a, if you're a resident in Paris, the line's longer. It's just a question of processing. For example, if you live out in the countryside and you submit a citizenship dossier, that can take like weeks. Why? Because there's one guy working, there's a bunch of old French people there and you. So who, who's in line ahead of you applying for citizenship? Nobody. So then they're gonna go and come and interview your neighbors and, and do all that. Well, in France and in Paris particularly, there's 2 million of us living inside the city. There's a few more than one people applying. So right now the lead time, once you've submitted your dossier is anywhere between 18 and 24 months. So it's a long time. I don't know what it is in the US. I'd be interested if anyone has gone through US citizenship and can tell us that in the, in the chat in which I am not looking at the moment. So I wasn't eligible, a, uh, eligible or interested in either the au pair or the student visa. I researched that. And so I got the visitor visa. Now the visitor visa, your main proof, unlike the au pair visa, where your main proof is I have an au pair contract or the student visa, I have an enrollment at school. The main criteria for the visitor visa is I have enough money not to be a drain on your social system. So that is going to be the SMIC. So do you have 1,400 euros a month of income? This could be from a remote job. It can be from a trust fund. It can be from access to a 401k that you're cashing out. Could be anything. But the point is, that is the main criteria. The French want to know, you're going to come over and you're going to be able to live off of that because you're, you're asserting yourself as a visitor. You also have to sign a declaration that you will not take a job in France. Now, this doesn't mean that a French company couldn't decide to sponsor you, but that means you would change visa classifications. So it doesn't mean you aren't eligible to interview for a French job or something. I just want to make sure I disabuse anybody of the notion that there are French companies just waiting to hire Americans because it's extremely expensive to sponsor somebody. So you need to have a Liam Neeson-esque special set of skills, okay? And if you do, then you might get hired. But if you don't, then you're just some person who knows about marketing or whatever else. They can find someone in the European Union among the 26 other countries here who can do what you can do. You have to have something really, really special going on for you in order to, to get a, a job sponsorship and it's quite expensive. So the visitor visa is what I was on for two years and I learned during that time about what French life was like and and frankly what the immigration process was like. It's a it's a it's a special thing shall we say. Immigration is special in general. It's really special when it's in a foreign language and it's really special when it's with the French. The main thing that I would tell you to understand the French mindset when you think about immigration is that these people have a job in which they, are list, they have a list of requirements for what you need to get what you're asking for. And they're looking at that sheet. And when you come in that day, they know that there are people who are not going to pay attention. And they're going to hand over some nonsense. They're going to say, this is not on the list. And all you're doing is making their day worse. If you come to a French immigration appointment, not only do you have everything that they asked for, you even have six things that they didn't ask for. You know, a list of the last three people you've dated, you know, references from them, right? These are things that you have and you're ready for. You're like, throw anything that you want at me. I didn't have that mindset. I first, I went in very scared. And I suppose that's how anyone immigrating normally does. And this is my second time as an immigrant. The first time was when my family moved from Singapore to the US. My father was an American, but I moved as a citizen. I've been a US citizen since I was born. So moving when you're nine years old and as a citizen is totally different from when you're, you're my age and you're not a citizen. And so fear, I think, is, is a dominant feeling. But once you figure out their mindset, it doesn't have to be fearful anymore. You just realize, I need to make sure I have everything they asked for on the list. And if you don't, you're not going to get it. Like there's no, there's no crying here. In fact, there, there are signs inside the French immigration offices, like any outburst, like we're going to call the police. Like you, you, you don't get, the customer is always right. That is an American notion, right? It is not a notion that prevails here in France. So if you want to throw some hissy fit, it's not going to, it's not going to work. So as I learned more about the immigration process and more about France in general, I 
realized that Profession Liberal would be a really good fit for me to continue my immigration journey for two reasons. One, I wanted to be able to work legally in France. And when I say work, I don't mean at a company. I wanted to be able to start a business because that's, that's what I do. I, I've been building businesses for, for 20 years now. And it would put me on a citizenship path. The visitor visa isn't, it doesn't, it's not a question of residence. You can have a visitor visa almost indefinitely. But as a visitor, you're not going to be paying taxes in France. You'll be filing taxes. You're required to file taxes every year that you're here, but you won't owe anything because you won't be able to generate French income because it's illegal under the classification of your visa, right? But uh, if, you, if you don't pay taxes, that's part of your citizenship package. They want to know that you've been contributing to life in France in some way. It doesn't mean you need to be paying a ton of taxes. The point is that you're paying some kind of taxes at all. And that's what they mean by residency. It's tax paying residency. So even when you're a student, you will have been paying some kind of taxes on the, the earnings that you have. So I got Profession Liberal and it's a one year trial period. And then after you've proven to them that you can do it for a year, you get a four year card, which meant after three years of going to an immigration office every year, then I haven't been to an immigration office since I think 2018, 2019, I think. So uh, that's really exciting. And that takes me all the way up to my uh, tax paying residency requirement. So I'm putting in my citizenship application in January. I was going to do it later this year, but as you know, there's been some disturbances in the earlier part of 2020, and I'm just going to wait for things to calm down a little bit more before submitting that. Questions. So this is not the final question spot. It's just questions related to everything I've talked about so far. I will have more to say, but questions. So I will stop sharing for a second. Yeah, one question with the professional liberal um, uh, visa that you did, what, what did you have? What were the requirements for that? Okay, so there are a lot of requirements for that. Um, I will say that the heart of it. So going back to the other visa classifications I've been talking about already. Um, the the proof for au pair is you have an au pair contract student, that you're a student, visitor, that you have money. For Profession Liberal, you need to assert that you can start this business, whatever it might be. So let's say you're going to start a graphic design business, right? The French need proof of that. So what would that look like? It could look like a degree in design. It could look like a job that you've had in design or a company that you've started, awards that you've won articles that have been written about you. Now, keep in mind, there are things for which there are simply no pre-qualifications. So one of my clients, I helped her get the Profleave visa, but she, she has a picnic business in Paris. So uh, back when it was normal for us to go out and picnic, um, she, would, she would arrange picnics for tourists, literally. They would show up to a location and there'd be a picnic basket with all these goodies out. Well, where would she go to the French to prove that she has the ability to host picnics, right? So she talked about event planning, she talked about marketing, but she couldn't really assert that she had any experience hosting picnics, right, professionally. So don't feel bad if you don't fit into something that has a nice degree, but I promise you that if you do have a nice degree, that is music to the French, uh, music to the French ear. Strangely enough, if you look at a French resume, what they call a CV over here, what's listed at the top is not your recent job experience, it's where you went to school. It doesn't matter if you went to school 20 years ago, the French are interested in where you went to school. And then they'll look at your job experience. Whereas for us in America, what's there is your last job experience and, oh, where did you go to school? Oh yeah, maybe we'll talk about that. But that gives you a little bit of insight into the French mind in terms of qualifications and certifications. Those things are really important to them. Okay, thanks. Yeah, because I'm trying to figure out I have a remote job in the US, um, was trying to get some sort of visa to come over to Paris, wasn't sure. You could, you, could go, Christine, you could go on a visitor visa. Okay. Because you have that income, right? Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't want to ask you how much you make, but as no, long but as- No, but it's open, not an issue. Yeah, exactly. You can just come as a visitor. Remember that if you come over in Prof. Lieb, you're starting a business, which means you're going to pay into the social security system, the healthcare system, your pension, all of that. Is that really what you want to do or do you want to live in France, right? So 
the question of prof leave versus visitor in this context, there's eight other visa classifications you can choose from, uh, is do I want to become a citizen or not? And I suppose I would, I would address that by saying residency is 95% citizenship. If you have a class A passport, like a US passport, which competes with the EU in terms of visa free access, and you have, you have European residency, that's pretty awesome. The only thing that you lack is a European, let's say passport, but your US passport will probably get you into the same number of places. And your EU residence card means that if the EU passport line is shorter, you can go into that line with your residence card. You don't have to have an EU passport. Uh, so that, that's a cool thing. And it meant that I was able to go and visit my family in the US um, last month because I have US citizenship, so they had to let me in. But I have e European residency, so they have to let me in when I come back. So you, just by having residency, not just in Europe, but anywhere else in the world, uh, you have more options. And that's a good thing. Thank you. So I'm just going to jump in real quick. Um, I know we only have until 1.15 today, so I'm going to let uh, Leah ask a few questions to Stephen. But Stephen, will you provide your email address or something, some way for it's It's here for the final slide. So that's right. to keep you guys here to the bitter end. Great. So at the last slide, you can get his email address. A lot of these, I mean, there's hundreds of questions coming in and you are a wealth of knowledge, but a lot of these are super specific. So I think save those for Steven. He's an incredible person. He's very generous with his knowledge. So I'm sure he's happy to answer those after. Um, but go ahead, Leah, you could ask some that came through. How many people are in here? We have 130 people. Oh, there you Sorry go. Sorry about that. I was frozen. Um, Steven, I'm not lying when I say that this is the most questions I've ever seen in a TNN event. So congratulations. I'm not going to be able to get through all of them, but I will drop your contact info in so that everyone else can see it as well. Um, I'll just get through a few. So John asked you to keep a mailing in mailing address in the US while living overseas for US taxes or do you get everything sent directly to your French address? Uh, I, I will tell you, you, your tax arrangements are something that you want to talk about with your accountant, but you will, pra on, for practical reasons, want to maintain a US address. And that could be a friend, it could be wherever uh, your driver's license is going to come up for renewal. <laughs> you can't renew your, your Massachusetts driver's license with a French address. So you will need to be able to do that. And you can uh, get a French license with a swap, but there's only 30 states that have an exchange agreement with France. So unless your state has that agreement, you can't just, you can do a, a one for one swap the, during the first year that you arrive. But if your state's not listed, then you can't. And you have to take the nightmare world of uh, getting a French license, which you don't need because this is a country unlike the United States in which you can exist without a vehicle. All right. Good to know. Okay. Is there an age limit, St. Jude Wellness? <laughs> is there an age limit for the student visa? I'm not sure if you answered that. No St. Jude Wellness. There is not <laughs> an age limit for the visa. Uh, how, you know, however, there, we're always students in life, right? So you can be as old as you'd like. It's just a question of how comfortable you are sitting with a bunch of uh, younger people in a classroom. But I'm sure they'll, they'll love you if you're older because you'll be a wealth of knowledge. Yep. Yep, that's how it is. Okay, so David wants to know if, uh, I guess, self-employment, what's the best or acceptable proof for the supposed self-employment? Can you show that as proof of work or income? Um, so depending on what your self-employment status is in the U.S., for example, if you have an S-Corp, you may be paying yourself W-2 income or 1099 income. The, the question will simply be to the French, can you provide them with a document that clearly states that you have the income necessary? So that could be amount of money in a bank account. And maybe it's in your business account. That's fine. Transfer it into your personal account. Take, take a snapshot of it, print it out for the French, and then transfer the money back. Um, they're mm -hmm. just interested to know that you have enough money. There's no way for them okay. to monitor your bank account. And frankly, they don't care. They just want to make sure that you've got enough money. Okay. That definitely makes sense. And I, and I know it doesn't sound like it's possible, but 1,400 euros a month is plenty to live on in, in Paris. Plenty. Like, I know it doesn't seem possible, but it is. 
it's very inexpensive to live here. Um, it's not New York or San Francisco or Leah, God forbid, Los Angeles in terms of expensive. It's not, we're not expensive compared to New York and San Francisco. <laughs> but you, Los Angeles is more expensive than Paris, that's for sure. Oh yeah, I mean, any um, US. Did you know US that baguettes city? are price controlled? A baguette cannot cost less than 80 cents, oh. but not more than a euro 20. Like, that's insane. And, well, it's like the national food, right? Like the national. If you think about how good the bread is and you like, you can buy like crap baguettes in San Francisco for like five bucks. Um, and they're not nearly as good as the price controlled baguettes here. So. Right. Of course, because we're not France. <laughs> it's all in the flour. It's all in the flour, really. Ah, yes, that makes sense. And everything's almond flour now. So <laughs> very different. <laughs> Okay, so how can we renew, John wants to know, how can we renew a one-year visit, visitor visa? Is that possible? That's a great question, yeah. You can, um, remember, it's only one years that are renewable. Like, you can't renew a three-month or a six-month. So you need to apply, if you want to renew, you need to apply for at least a one-year. And on the, on the box, on the form, you need to check one-year plus, not the six months to one-year box. That will screw you. Okay. So renewal is actually even easier than getting the visa in the first place. Because what has happened at this point is you're not having to prove to the French government that you can move to France. You have to prove to the French government that you are living in France. And so what does that come with? That's your tax return that you'll file. So we file taxes here in June. And then in September, we get a little sheet from the Ministry of Finance that says, we agree with your assertions. And here's proof that you are a good little boy or girl. <laughs> and, and you keep those documents. Do not ever, ever, ever throw away your French documents ever. Don't even think about it. Even if you're a minimalist, you need to keep all of this stuff, okay? Uh, so you're gonna need to pr present them with a tax return. You're also gonna need to present them with a translated, uh, a certified version of your birth certificate, as well as 12 months of French bank statements. Now, it could be that it took you a couple months to get a French bank account, so maybe 10 months. But what they're gonna be looking for there is that this French bank account shows that you've started to make a life here. You're paying your rent out of there. You're paying your electricity bill, your cell phone bill. And they're also auditing it to make sure you're not getting any money from a French company illegally. <laughs> so that's yeah. mostly when I saw her looking through my bank account, she was going too fast to, to really be paying attention. She was looking in the credits column and she was looking for a French company name. So they're really auditing you less for your spending and more for your compliance with your visa status. Okay. Great. Great for that. Uh, thank you for that information. So let's see, let's go on. Danielle and Alda both have similar questions and they just want to get this straight. A master's and one year of working after the master's can make you eligible to apply for citizenship? So you're, you're, that's really close. So essentially, if you earn a master's degree in France, so you can't come with a master's degree. You have to earn the master's degree in France. If you earn that, you are eligible to apply for a one-year employment visa. Now, you have to find employment during that year. If yeah. you don't, game over. But if you do get employment during that year, the, stu the, the master's year, or maybe two years of master's, mm -hmm. plus your employment looking year is enough to get you two years because they shave three years off of the five-year requirement. So you may already exceed it by the time you finish your master's. You don't need that extra year of job seeking. Mm -hmm. but the point is, it's a cheat code. Okay. So would that, could you do that? Say you still haven't found employment after the second year. Can you then go on like a visitor visa and try to find you have work? To go no? home, you have to go home to your home country and reapply. You, you're, ah. You'll be on a, you're on a non-renewable visa. Now you could possibly change to an eligible visa status. So possibly you could change to prof leave and start your own business. That's possible. But if you don't and you run out of time. Now, I haven't mentioned this. The, the, the elephant in the room is you could always fall in love with somebody French. And if you do, then let's say you have more visa options, but it needs to be provable. They will ask for your Facebook messenger history. They are going to look and find out how real this relationship is. They've had too many fake marriages over the past <laughs> however many years. So you are not gonna get away with, oh, I met this really cool person two weeks before my visa expires and it's true love. The French are gonna say, yeah, no. So basically start tindering now, like start <laughs> chatting have, now, right? Like 
support function, don't they, in Tinder? So, I mean, you could do that. <laughs> or Hinge or Bumble. Start talking to them now. Facebook Messenger now. <laughs> well, dating in France, that's an entirely different uh, a webinar for another day. Yeah, I can't even imagine, to, to be honest. <laughs> okay. So let's see, um, let's go to a more specific, or can, can Rachel, Rochelle, sorry, Rochelle Bunker, can provide examples of niche skills that are deemed as highly regarded or needed? Uh, when you say niche skills, do you mean uh, as in the French are desirable, de desiring that? Sure. It's not like the Australian point space system where there's, uh, there's yep. scores, that, that it's not how that works. Yeah. Um, I used it actually. I went on a working holiday visa to Australia, and I. My so visa it's ran not. It's not. Me. It's not a point system. It's a question of plausibility. Can Can you do okay. this? So you don't have to have a special skill. Now, if you do have a special skill, there's there's a visa classification called passeport talent, which is talent in English, right? Talent. It just sounds so much nicer in French, doesn't it? Um, and that's a different regime. And there's even sometimes money from the French government for that regime but it's too much more detail to go into with still more stuff I want to talk about. Okay. Okay. Um, let's go ahead then and have you continue on with the presentation since we only have a few more minutes left here. I know there's just even more questions popping up. So go ahead. Okay. I'm going to give you the floor back, Stephen. All right. So questions uh, done. Musical interlude. Uh, if I had a guitar right now, I'd be playing for you guys. I do not have the ability to play a guitar. Actually, I'd be a banjo. Love that banjo sound. So things I never expected to happen. I lost weight. I moved to France and I dropped 20 pounds. I just want you to imagine 20 more pounds of chipmunk love right here. That's where it was. Uh, gone. And what's my million dollar French diet book? It's one page long and it's three paragraphs. The first is portion sizes. Portion sizes in France are what we would call human-sized portion sizes, as opposed to what you'd get at Cheesecake Factory, which is enough to serve six people, right? So when I go to America these days, I just ask for the doggy bag right away. So like, bring me my plate. I'm going to scrape half of this off into the bag, and now it's a reasonable portion size. So portion size, big thing. Secondly, the walking that happens in European cities is significant. So I was just telling Erica, the reason I was able to treat myself to a five guys milkshake yesterday, which included bacon, peanut butter, and banana, and weighed in at 1200 calories, is because I walked 16K yesterday showing a friend around town. You can afford a 1200 calorie milkshake when you're walking 16 kilometers. Uh, so there's just a more sustainable way of life in terms of walking. You don't have to go to the gym to get your exercise. You can get your exercise walking up and down the stairs with your groceries. But finally, the food is just poisonous in the United States. Uh, and I'm not saying this to be hurtful. I lived in America for 25 years. My family lives in America. And I know there are some awesome things happening with sustainability and local, local gardens and organic food right now. But generally speaking, in most of the United States, the food is poisonous. And that just has effects. I know, for example, when I go to the US, I'm going to gain roughly two pounds a week every week I'm there. And when I come back, it's gone in about two weeks. I've been doing this for seven years now. I've got it down to an exact amount of weight. And I indulge in stuff. Like my very first stop off the airplane was at Waffle House. Um, that's just the reality of things. Like Waffle House is an amazing part of life. Sorry for those of you who live in places without Waffle House. Um, the way I cooked changed. So my mom has a, uh, my mother's Chinese. My father was American and I was taught to cook in this Southern Chinese style. And a lot of that means transforming your protein or transforming your vegetables. That's why it's sweet and sour pork, or you've got this Tom Yum soup there, or in Singapore, we have chili crab. You're going to take this protein and you're going to transform it into something else. That is not how the French work. The French want to extract the flavor from that. So they want the most chickeny chicken. They want the beefiest beef. They want the squashiest squash. They want the most carroty carrot. And what that means is the way that I cook totally changed subconsciously because you just, you hang out with the French and you think about them and you talk. And then over time, my, my cooking habits just changed. And I noticed I was using less and less of my spice rack because it's just not how the French cook. And it was, it was pointed out to me one day when I was cooking for some friends in Burgundy. And they said, where did you, where did you learn how to do all this? And I, and I realized at that point that the French had messed with the way that I cooked. You know, not for the better, for the worse. The Chinese have their own way of cooking. The French have their own way of cooking. But 
you cannot resist the pull of culture when you're living in the country. That's just how it is. If I lived in Germany, I would be loving sausages and beer. Like that's just the way of life over there. I already happen to love sausages and beer, but um, the way I spoke English changed. So when you're not speaking with native speakers of the language, they'll, they'll ask you to slow down a lot. And so your English just slows down naturally, unless you know you're with a friend who's visiting. You just slow down a lot. And then you'll also realize because there's so many other English speakers around you who are not from America, you'll say stuff like, well, as we say in American English, dot, dot, dot. Because sometimes they just, they don't have the same expressions that we do. Uh, and, and there's other fun stuff too, like, you know, when you say when pigs fly, and your French friend goes, what's, what is, uh, what is that? Uh, the pigs, you say the pigs are fine. And uh, you say, no, 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 uh, it means something impossible. They go, oh, uh, oh quand le poule rend les dents. And you're like, uh, oh, when the chicken will have teeth? Yeah, actually, I like that better than pigs flying. Because chicken having teeth, if you visualize that, that's a hilarious, it's a hilarious image. It's way more hilarious than pigs flying. So three things that I never expected to happen. I lost weight. I changed the way that I cook and the way that I spoke English slowed down, became more deliberate and really became more interested in understanding how differently we speak English in different parts of the world. Okay, life in Europe, travel opportunities here. Guys, the coolest story I have here is that I went to, a friend and I were trying to, we'd been in a business mastermind together and we were just hoping to have a longer conversation. Our schedules couldn't line up. And so Ryanair had a five euro flight to Dublin. And I said, you know, I'm just gonna come have lunch with you and I'm gonna go home, like after lunch. To put this in perspective, five euros for the flight and it's maybe an hour and 15 minutes from Paris to, to Dublin. To get to this airport, it's not a Paris airport, it's in Beauvais. So it's a hour and 15 minute shuttle ride and 17 euros. So it cost me more and took me longer to take the shuttle to the airport than it did for me to get to Dublin. Um, and, and when I told the customs lady that I was just coming to have lunch with a friend, she looked at me like I was crazy. I'm like, it's Ryanair. She's like, oh, okay. So five euros. And there's stuff like that all the time. Like the airfares right now, I don't need to tell you, are ridiculous um, because they're trying to get people to fly and people are doing that because Europe's mostly open inside. So the travel opportunities here, bus, train, plane. And there's also this thing called Blah Blah Car. Has anybody heard of Blah Blah Car? Just raise your hand. I don't think I can see anybody really. Oh, Erica has. Okay, so blah, blah, car. Imagine a crowdsourced lift uh, long distance. So let's say I, I'm going home to Amsterdam this weekend because I'm going to go see my family. I've got three seats in my car. So I just specify uh, non-smoker, no pets. I listen to jazz music. And then people bid for that spot and I accept them or I don't. And you get reviews like Airbnb or whatever else. And it's government controlled that you can't make money off the ride. You can just only cover your gas costs. So you could get that ride for like 17 bucks or like 18 bucks. It's crazy. But there's so many cool options in Europe. And the quality of life here is unbelievable. The, the ability to, to see things, to interact with people in different languages. Um, there's GMOs are illegal. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's produce everywhere here is amazing and you never have to worry about like what's in season because all you have to do is look at what's at the market so right now it's italian plums is what it looks like they're these green plums i need to buy some but you could just buy whatever's in season because you'll see it either on the cakes and the tarts or at the markets and it's just amazing and that's not just true in france it's true in so many other countries in europe um what about life in france it's pretty much a perfect country it's 0.75, it's 75% the size of Texas if, if Americans want to get a sense of the size of it. So it's, of course, not anything is bigger than Texas. I mean, that's just Texas, right? But to give you a sense, if you like cut the Texas panhandle off, that's probably how big France is. Uh, they've got a warm water coast. They've got a cold water coast. They have Spanish speaking mountains. They have Italian and German speaking mountains. They have wine regions. They have cheese regions. They have different oyster regions. Champagne, need I say more? Um, not only that, if you're into history, we have some of the best uh, classical, so Roman ruins. There's an amphitheater, there's a, there's a Colosseum that's in the south of France that's better preserved than anything in Italy. If you've been to maybe Croatia, Dubrovnik and Split, you've seen things that are that well preserved, but they're even better preserved in France. Um, so 
we have all sorts of cool countries bordering us. You can take a train. You can be in London in two hours and 15 minutes from the center of Paris to the middle uh, to St. Pancras. Um, and if you book far enough in advance, that's like 50 bucks each way. So quality of life here is really great. Um, France itself is centrally located in, in Western Europe. And I put, now you understand why they are so proud. Um, there's a wonderful book by Stephen Clark called A Year in the Merde. And French and Merde, mean, uh, Merde in French means shit. And uh, one, of, one of the lines in there that I've said will help you decode the French. It says, in the back of every French person's head is a voice. That voice is saying, I am French and I am right. And if you understand that, then you understand a lot of things about the French, right? It'll put everything into context for you. So I am French and I am right. And when you live in their country for long enough, you're like, yeah, I get it, man. You're French and you're right. Life in Paris. So we've gone from Europe to France to Paris. The whole world comes here. I still remember there's this amazing Velasquez exhibit in 2014. There were more Velasquez's here in Paris for that exhibit than had existed since the time Velasquez was painting for, for Philip IV, right? It was unbelievable. We have ballet that comes here, opera, um, World Cups, uh, Olympics, sporting events. If you're interested in stuff, everyone comes here. Uh, it's a 2000 year old city, but it still very much feels like a small town. If you've lived in Los Angeles or San Francisco or London or Seattle, these are giant sprawling things. The Paris is surrounded by a ring road. I know I'm gonna say this number and people are like, that's not a small town, uh, but it's 2 million people. But if you think about that, like Kansas City, for example, is 2 million people, but spread out over a much larger portion. We, we do live much more closely together, but it still has very much of a small town feel. Uh, night pass. So I took this in February 2014. Uh, we won't be able to see something like this for a while, but we will see it eventually. And there's all sorts of wonderful, beautiful things you can see at night here in Paris. So I'm not saying you have to live in Paris. I am definitely a Paris partisan, but there are wonderful places that you can live outside of Paris. And in fact, many French people would correctly argue that Paris is not France, the way that Berlin is not Germany, the way London is not England, and the way that New York City is not the United States. Right. So there's validity to that statement. It doesn't mean that there's not a lot of awesome Frenchness here. It's that it's a bad representation of the rest of the country. So there's other cool places that you can live outside of Paris, but I am a big fan of the city. No desire to return to America. Uh, cost of living is so high in the United States, uh, not least of which is health insurance. So I know this will be painful to hear, but my health insurance is something like 30 euros a month to pay, and there's no limits. There's no lifetime limits on my, my coverage. Now, that's 70% reimbursement. It's a single payer system. So if I pay $100 to my dentist, which I don't, so I'll get 70% of that reimbursed into my bank account, and then I'm responsible for the 30%. Now, people who go to the doctor wherever um, frequently enough, they buy a top-up insurance that even covers that 30%, but I don't go to the doctor enough. I would pay more for the insurance than I would for the, the top-up. So same thing with the vehicles. If you subtract the cost of a vehicle out of your life, what could you do with that money? I want you to think about that. You change nothing else in your life, but you remove a car payment, insurance, gas, oil changes, car washes. And that hole is in most people's budget. A third of the people in France don't even have a driver's license. Don't even have one. So when I talk about low quality of life, I don't mean that uh, there's riots or anything happening. Oh, wait. I'm saying that the quality of life is, it's, it's not as good as people think once they've had a chance to leave the United States and see other opportunities. They'll say, well, you know what? That kind of sucks that I have to pay $12,000 a year for health insurance. That sucks that I have to dedicate $10,000 of my income to a vehicle, which I only use to get to and from work or these other things. Uh, for me, as I say, it's perfectly located between Singapore. I'm seven hours behind in time zone, and I'm seven hours ahead of Kansas City. And uh, flights are really great going both places. And I've never been happier. So why would I want to go back? Uh, so this December marks the beginning of my eighth year. Questions? Stephen, I think, do you have any more to this presentation? Or is this oh, you, you want, okay. I will, I will skip, we will go to directly to the lightning round. Okay, <laughs> questions. I like to teach. 
someone captured me in a goofy, like, let's see if I can replicate it. Uh, and so I do courses and special prizes. You guys have waited this long. If you donate today for this webinar, which Erica and Leah have been kind enough to facilitate and put on for us, or you're already a Patreon member, you're going to get access to one of my free courses, a travel course. Um, you guys are travel nerds, so I may not be telling you anything in that course you don't know, but I, I promise you'll probably learn at least one thing. And anyway, it's free. So you're going to email proof of the fact that you've donated today or proof of your Patreon membership to Stephen at thelifeyouwant.eu. Anyone who's interested in courses for the type of visas I talked about that I've obtained, the Profession Liberal or the Visitor Visa, you'll get 75% off. Crazy sauce. There's the coupon code. I'm happy to email it to you if you don't have a pen to write this down at the moment. Or you can screenshot it, camera. Anyone interested in my other courses, including how to start a business or two income stream possibilities you can use in the US or in France, like becoming an Airbnb super host or a meetup organizer, I'm offering 50% off those courses. And all those are on offer until the end of this month. Thanks for your time. There's my email address, Stephen at thelifeyouwant.eu. If you prefer other social media platforms, you're gonna find me almost everywhere with at the at Stephen Heiner. So Twitter, Instagram, et cetera, Facebook. Uh, okay, Erica, I got to the end. So now we can get more questions. Go. Yes, we have a lot more that popped up on culture and a few other things. Erica, sorry, did you want to say something before? Um, yeah, why don't we just, before the questions, why don't we just do the end announcements just because it's one o'clock and some people might want to jump off. Jump so off, yep. Share my screen real quick. Um, All right, so before you leave, everyone, <laughs> We do want to let you know that we have some upcoming events. Next week, we have three. On Tuesday, we have How to Travel with a Full-Time Job with Danielle. And all this is up on the screen as well, um, if, if you can't hear me for whatever reason. And then Thursday, we have two. One with Matt himself, a beginner tutorial on travel hacking. Erica says I need to travel hack more, so I will be... Oh, I'm hosting, so I will be there, and I hope to see you there, because who doesn't want to save money? Apparently, I didn't until Erica told me I needed to. So, And then um, next, we have Rick coming back. Rick was one of our first presenters for the Nomadic Network, and one question that kept coming up in his was, how many countries are there, really? So please join us. We have all of the events up on nomadicnetwork.com forward slash events. You'll see them for the next few weeks there. And we are an exclusive community, which you can join. Well, like, I mean, these events are all free and through the grace of our goodness, grace, and, re and knowledge of our speakers. But we do have a Patreon for Nomadic Matt. So if you scan this, it takes you right to the page. Right, Erica? Yeah. So all you have to do is just bring your camera up, and you can just click the QR code in your um, camera and it'll just pop up the website. So this is super easy. Otherwise it's patreon.com slash nomadic mat and it's in the chat, I just added it. But this is one of the things that will get you access to the freebies that Steven has generally generously offered. And if I'm gonna leave this up for like two more seconds. Yep. And then if uh, you don't wanna be a part of our Patreon community, by the way, this is where you can find this replay too. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't want to be a part of our community, that's perfectly fine. We also accept donations. As you know, the whole travel industry is suffering right now. We love bringing you these events. We love bringing you travel content. And it's really, really helpful um, while nobody's traveling right now to get even like very small donations are super helpful. I know Steven has brought you so much information today. He's going to answer a few more questions. He's got his email address so you can get this to you. Like we are so happy to bring you uh, resources like this. Steven is super passionate. He is the chapter leader. We have chapter leaders coming on and sharing. We have people that are experts in different industries coming on and sharing and we love bringing this to you. However, it does cost something to run these events and to run Nomadic Mat. So we really appreciate your 
uh, you know, donations and you're joining the Patreon page. And so with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and bring it back to Leah and Steven so that they can finish their, um, their Q&A. Thank Steven, you so Steven, could you drop, oh, thank you, Erica. Steven, could you drop your email in the chat or say it out loud so that I can write it in? Because I think the last 17 questions were, what's your email again? <laughs> All right, hold on, I'll put it in there. Everyone okay, thank you. <laughs> There it is, everybody. There you go. Thank you so much. Okay, for that. lightning round. Let's go. Yes, lightning round. Okay. So, on average, what would you say you spend on regular life, like everyday things, every month, living in Paris? I would say if you if you live in a, a second or third tier American city, uh, or even it's going to be less than whatever you'd spend in a first tier American city. So, um, like a, something like this size of milk would vary. Uh, but you can get like organic milk from Brittany this size for like three euros, whatever that is in dollars. Um, wow. There's like, I don't know, 50 different types of butter. And you could get butter that's like, like twice the size of this for like three, four euros. Um, fruit. Uh, we get a lot of, uh, we have it also have a Spanish speaking country on our border as well. Uh, we get a lot of hot um, like we get avocados from there, figs. Um, it's really, it's really not expensive in terms of groceries and in terms of an apartment, uh, you can get a studio apartment here for around 750 euros a month. You could, you could share a space for much less if you wanted to live. And again, if you want to live in the countryside, you can pay nothing. Like it's much, much cheaper. Like you can buy a place an hour outside of Paris for like a hundred grand. Um, wow. A thou that's like a thousand seven fifty euros like a thousand US for a studio about right? I don't know the exchange no, rate really well. It's not eight eighty eight. Sorry, I was thinking in Australian dollars. I don't know why I was thinking in Australian dollars. Because um, you want to go to Australia. Leo, I do. I saw that picture it. and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> need to go. Must go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. It's very it literally sounds like it's literally farm to table, straight from the source, much like like California, so I'm lucky enough to live here and experience that as well. Um, let's see, Stephanie wants to know what you don't like about France or what things maybe took a lot longer for you to adjust to. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't not like anything about the French um, because, because I have to accept that that's who they are, right? So for example, the French complain like there's no tomorrow. And there's a famous French intellectual who says, that, the Fr that France is a country full of people who live in heaven, but think they live in hell, right? So they, they <laughs> complain about the silliest things. Uh, you're talking about people that gets 30 days of paid vacation on, by law on top of the two weeks of national holidays that we get. Like the entire country's on vacation now, despite the fact that something happened earlier this year, nothing stops vacation, baby. Like we're all gone at the moment, like nobody's here. So, um, Yes, I would say I, I, I don't like that aspect of them, but it's culturally part of who they are. Um, that's fine. Uh, some people who are very law and order types, like uh, if you have any Germanic descent, you may not like the French, the fact the French are very casual when it comes to, if, if for example, if the government makes a recommendation like, well, we think you should wear masks. That means to the French, don't wear masks. Because <laughs> these are people who jaywalk all the time, right? It's recommended that you don't jaywalk. Oh, that means I'm gonna jaywalk. They sound like Americans. <laughs> no <laughs> does this not mind. sound familiar <laughs> <laughs> keep in mind that if whatever whatever it is that you find or you don't like or you like if you're going to make a home here i think you have to accept them for who they are um sure. like or dislike doesn't really come into it for me sure okay okay i'm going to do two more questions because i know you have a hard stop in a, in a few minutes so uh elena kennedy what, what, wants you, oh sorry it, so i can go nine more minutes from now and then i really really have to go i'm having okay. dinner Yep. No worries. Priorities. Um, Priorities. Yes, absolutely. We understand. I love, I love all of you people, but dinner in France, I mean, come on. Yes. Well, why don't we just take it, like, you just want to take the computer and, like, take a swing, <laughs> please. <laughs> okay, so okay. nine minutes. Let's see if we can do nine questions. Yes, we can. Oh, wow. Um, Elena Kennedy, what question should I, should I be asking myself before I move to France? She's American, and her boyfriend is French and lives there. Uh, would you move to France if your boyfriend wasn't there? That's the question I would ask. Excellent question. Excellent question. I hope Elena was on to hear that. <laughs> okay. 
Um, let's see. Carla and a few other people want to know the get you said you have to produce a negative COVID test within 72 hours. Is that just for going to France? That's Do you know that, if it's that's, the that's coming here to France? That's coming here to France specifically. Okay. And remember that when you get here, you better have a reason for being here. So either you have a student visa or you have residence. You you can mm. come to France right now as an American. You just need to come in through another country inside Schengen. So if you can get into another country in Europe, you can come here. There won't be any COVID tests or whatever. There's no COVID tests at the airport. But if you want to come directly from the U.S. into France, there's not even that many direct flights. You're going to need to produce a negative COVID test as an American. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Um, let's see. Doug has asked, and forgive me if you've already answered this, have you retained your U.S. citizenship? Because if you have. So you're still obligated to pay taxes and your income contribute to social security in that way. And you don't have to contribute to social security. Um, that's a, that's a job thing. If you have a job in the U S then okay. you contribute to social security, but uh, yes, um, the country that was ostensibly founded on a tax revolt is one of only two countries that taxes people based on their citizenship, not based on their residency. Chew on that one. Wow. I'm okay. not saying I'm always going to retain my U S citizenship by the way, but that's a discussion for another time. Sure. Okay. Because isn't it, well, I think some countries make you declare one, don't they? Mm, France doesn't. No, France. Okay. And remember That's some good. countries it's illegal to have a second, the Netherlands, <laughs> Norway, Japan, right. Singapore. I guess that's what I was thinking about was that some countries are like, you have to basically declare which one do you want, you know? Right. And then um, you get deported if you don't have a residency. Oof, there. I know. Okay. <laughs> Directly to another country, um, French visitor visa. So, oh, someone wanted to know uh, two questions about this. Someone wanted to know if any, if a lot of this changes for retirees or people over the age of 55, 65, uh, Deal wants to know, can we apply for French vis Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, my husband, yeah, Deal said, my husband and I are retired. Can we apply for a French visitor visa? Is there? Sure, sure. There's no, there's no age limit. There's no, again, the au pair visa is the only one that has that. So I'm sorry, you're out of luck, retirees, to be an au pair, but uh, there's no age limit on anything. Do you just have to follow the sequence for everything. Okay, and what was the age limit on the au pair visa again? 18 to 30. Ah, okay, like Australia as well. <laughs> okay. It's that age, they want, they want you to get in there in that, that time period. I know, are they talking about extending it at all? No. No, it's already, okay. It's already, like, it, no. <laughs> it's already being debated that it's too old. Really? I mean, a 29 year old au pair. 30 is the new, 30 is the new 20. It's definitely, it's definitely stretching it for the French. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Um, there's so many here. So, everyone, if we didn't get to your question, please go ahead and message Stephen um, separately. He gave you his email. I do want to ask, I know this has come up a few times. Have you seen, there's a Netflix docu-series with Zac Efron called Down to Earth. And episode two is all about how the water, all the water in Paris is drinkable. What oh, are your wow. thoughts? You, you, you got to something experience? awesome. I was like, I was like, Netflix, don't watch. Zac Efron, don't know. I know. Like, <laughs> and, then, and then you're like, all the water. Yeah, the, the city's been around for 2,000 years. And remember, Romans are the ones who really expanded the city. So yeah, all our, all our water is drinkable. Like, like this, this came out of the tap. We all refill <laughs> bottles and we put them in the fridge here. So. But they're saying like even the fountain, the water structures, yeah. like yeah, the but fountains. It's like, that in, it's, like that in, it's like that in Rome too. And ah, I would argue okay. Rome water is better because that's all coming from springs that the Romans dug a long time ago. So that's like spring water. Ours has all been processed. So it's going to have more of a Dasani taste to it, but mm -hmm. like French Dasani, so like Dasane or something. <laughs> but um, it's very drinkable, very drinkable. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you, you, um, Netflix, Zac Efron. I know. Yes. <laughs> but you know Correct. what? They had a great, uh, they had this like superfood guru on. And to be honest, he probably doesn't have as much star power. So they needed Zac Efron. That's why they're like, bring him on. And he's learning just like the rest of us. So, okay. um, Eric, are there any other questions that you wanted to add in and jump? I know so many of these are big ones. They're, they've been repeated. We've answered quite a few big ticket ones. So I feel like 
for the rest of the questions. There's a lot of like super specific questions and I don't even know if Steven will be able to answer them, but specific questions are really great for emails. So if you want to ask him and hopefully he can answer them or at I, least- I'm just, I'm just, this is the first time I've allowed myself to look down at the bottom of the chat window. So I'm just gonna answer those two really quickly. So yeah. Bridget, uh, can someone working for a US company remotely live in France under a visitor visa? Yes. Um, and if you want to replay this from the beginning. Uh, from Keys, does a French visa apply to travel throughout the Schengen zone or in the rest of the zone still limited to 90 days? Yeah, uh, if you have a residence visa here, your, your um, limits go away. You can go wherever you want for however long you want. Remember, residency is 95% citizenship. That's how I was able to come back here in the middle of a quote unquote lockdown pandemic, whatever you want to call it. I was able to fly to America and come back because I have residency. Wow. Yeah. And then Matthew is asking, does any of this info apply to moving to anywhere else in the European Union? Insofar as there are friendly visa programs, look to Germany. Germany has a very little known six month job seekers visa. Very easy to get that they don't talk about. Uh, but your German game needs to be up if you want to go oh. to Germany. And the Netherlands has a pretty friendly, I think, program as well. You don't necessarily have to speak <laughs> if you want to get that visa. Um, but our visa regimes are just for France. So all of the info I spoke about, it doesn't mean that another regime in Spain, for example, doesn't look extremely similar. Like the Portuguese visitor visa looks extremely similar to ours, but it, it's not by any means an EU wide program. You should look at it specifically as a French program with probably great similarities in other countries. I will tell you the French bureaucracy as exasperating as it is, is not anywhere near as exasperating as Sp Spanish bureaucracy from what I've been told by friends who live in Spain. <laughs> like it, it is the worst apparently <laughs> i will i will say really quickly anyone if you want to save the chat you're able to um you just click the three dots in the bottom right hand corner and that goes for you steven if you know you want to see what everyone else is asking three dots bottom right hand corner hit save chat and it'll pop up in a window hot mm -hmm. tip <laughs> private consulting possible with me yes uh how do you qualify for the insurance um well, you, you just buy insurance, right? So if you're talking about it being part of the French healthcare system, you're going to have to pay for that, right? Again, this idea of free healthcare, like you, everyone pays, like it's not free. Um, and even when you go to the doctor, it's not free. You have to pay. You just get reimbursed a certain amount. Um, if you want to enter the French system, for example, as a retiree, it's 8% of your worldwide income. That's the cost. Um, not bad. Any other? Do you want to answer? I'm, I'm like I'm just I'm zooming. There's so many. Uh, there's Stephen's French like... accented English is very good. Well, when you live uh, when you live with these people for seven years, uh, you you completely understand how they they talk when they. I watched a lot of pulp fiction when I was a kid, Stephen. That's that's how I learned. <laughs> um, that's awesome. We don't want to keep it, you from bacon <laughs> bacon and a milkshake. Yes, five guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't knock you try it. Peanut butter, banana, bacon. Okay. That's it, guys. I have to call time. I really have to go. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. It's a pleasure sharing this information with you. As I said, uh, those offers stand until the end of the month. Email me, Stephen, S-T-P-H-E-N, at thelifeyouwant.eu with any, any questions. I'll do my best to help. And again, thanks to Leah for facilitating and Erica for putting this together. Yeah, thank you. And you guys, he did this out of the kindness of his heart and just the passion for like sharing this knowledge. So like, we're forever grateful. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thanks for running the Paris chapter. If anyone's in Paris, Woo! things open up and we can have events again, be sure to stop by. And You're welcome to stop by. Bye guys. Bye Stephen. Thank you. Bye. Thank you everyone.